today we are with Nikolai. I have Hello. Like <laughs> who is a senior escalation specialist and support part of global services at Percona. And it is a pleasure to have you, Nikolai. How are you today? Oh, good. Uh, I'm actually happy to work on the different things in Percona. And I like to do databases and complex database setup. And today we will check some complex replication setup for the Kubernetes. Oh, that's that's amazing. So, Nikolai, I would like to know a little bit about your background. Could you tell us? I'm working uh, for a really long time in the databases, uh, mostly in open source one. I'm working with MySQL, with Postgres, uh, MongoDB, and I actually like uh, how much possible with open source databases, especially if it's uh, related to clustering. Uh, so we can control a huge amount of databases and keep them uh, well maintained. So now you are working also with Kubernetes, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, this demonstration is related to the Kubernetes because we want not only show how data could be replicated between Postgres servers, but also show that it could involve uh, high available setup uh, with many servers involved. And Nicola, also I saw that more and more people are using Percon operators uh, for their databases. Uh, what is a standby cluster and why do we need Percon operators, especially Percon operator for PostgreSQL? There are databases uh, that require to be available uh, for the some period. Like during the day, we need the database. And if it goes down for half an hour, no problem from this. But most of databases containing important data, that's why you worry not only about uh, duplicating the database in the same data center, but you also want to have a data copy alive in some other uh, geographic location. Okay, so the terminal is all yours. Let's start with this Hanson. Okay, so uh, here actually uh, the cluster is already configured. Mm -hmm. uh, let's uh, check what we have. We have a few nodes. We have three servers that running bunch of services and services with suffix instance are related to Postgres and PG Bouncer ones, uh, of course, uh, is related to the Postgres uh, connection pool. So let's check, uh, well, we have three servers, but database usually need a single one. So let's go to uh, the one of those servers and then uh, we will see what's inside. Okay, uh, we have multiple containers. Let's use database container for this port. And uh, okay, I should have an enter reactive session. Okay, now we are inside a pod and this pod runs Postgres. And also, as you can see, uh, this Postgres instance managed by Patroni. Patroni is a clustering application that allows to keep replication ongoing if you have multiple primary and standby servers. So let's see what we have for the Patroni status. Is Patroni integrated into the database when I install Postgres, for example, or is something that I need to install separately? Well, uh, Docker images and Kubernetes uh, world uh, reduces the opportunity to install something. Instead, you have uh, you are choosing what are you going to run and choosing which version you need. 
So here, uh, everything is pre-installed, but of course with a normal Postgres installation, you don't have Patroni. Mm -hmm. And especially uh, it's not only installed here, but it's also pre-configured. So uh, we are on the server finishing with uh, R2. Mm -hmm. And this R2 is also managed mentioned in the list. So instead of list, we can also use topology. Mm -hmm. So those commands are pretty similar, but topology one shows that we have a leader and two replicas. So what it means that we can uh, create a database and of course connect to this database. We can create a table. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, let's use just a name for oh, 100 characters will be enough to any animal, at least I hope. <laughs> and okay, we have this table and let's insert something. Okay. So which animal to choose? Who is uh, number one? Let's cat. use lion. Okay. <laughs> okay, it's kind of cat. <laughs> yes. Okay, now uh, we can switch to other database instances we have in this cluster and see, for example, this one. Oh, of course, I'm joining to the Postgres database, but uh, well, we should have a zoo database on this server as well. Yeah, and we have it. This is another container. You are accessing to the to the container second, right? The second container. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this container executed on a different node. Mm -hmm. So data is here, mm -hmm. and if we run a wide output for our ports, we can see that all those Postgres instances are actually running on different servers. And this is pretty expected because if you are losing a physical machine, you want to have your database available on some different location. Mm -hmm. So, uh, if we go again inside of those databases, uh, you can imagine, oh, okay, how those was created. Uh, the easiest way to create a copy for the database for the replication, make a backup. So for backups here, pgbcrust is used. Okay. And as you can see, we have a full backup, uh, this cluster, just created a few minutes ago and it was completely new. So where this backup should be stored? The traditional um, approach for good old uh, Postgres databases use some directory and store it, but we will lose everything if the server goes down with all disks. So it should copy things to some network share and etc. But this is not a good approach in clouds because NFS is not really fast. It has a huge overhead. And instead we should use something modern like uh, object storage, like S3. So let's check uh, pgbcrest configuration. ETC pgbcrest shows something. Oh, okay, we have pgbcrest instance. Okay, uh, here you can see that, uh, yeah, we're using uh, S3 for backups and we are storing the database and all changes that the database receives are written in write ahead logs. And we are storing write ahead logs here and those write ahead logs updated as soon as 
uh, they arrived uh, to Postgres. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I have one question. Um, yeah, 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 sure. When we use a PG backrest, we're talking about uh, physical and logical backups for the database? Well, let's uh, draw uh, a point there. We have physical backups and where we have logical backups. Logical backups is a way to store backups in a completely different format than physical files. And PG backrest, it just copies all physical files and it can compress it, but it's still same files as you have in your database at some moment in the past. And then PG backrest can apply more files to make this uh, database structure uh, actual to specific uh, date and time. So here you can see that uh, the S3 existing in this particular cluster. Yeah, because this is uh, a bit of simplification. In order to set up, uh, to make this uh, demonstration, I've used the same cluster uh, for backup, but in real production, you should put it in some different location. So let's go inside. And we can run bash as well in this uh, repository. And, and yeah, this is, by the way, uh, the open source implementation of famous Amazon S3 protocol. So this server works uh, in a very similar way, but it's not require Amazon Cloud for you. You can run it in your private space, or you can use it in any cloud, or you can assume that here you're using S3, but on Google Cloud, you will use GCS, and on Amazon, you will use uh, S3. But also because this PG backrest thing is not uh, limited to the specific cloud, you can use, for example, uh, GCS here, uh, or you can use GCS from uh, Amazon cloud. So you will be sure that your data is on completely different render. Okay, here, uh, there is uh, my bucket, it was operator testing. And we can PG backrest backup repository. So uh, it contains two things. One is archive. And yeah, uh, it's very important that because it's a physical backup, we should use exactly the same Postgres version everywhere. So yeah, we have some uh, write ahead log file here. So if we go to the uh, backup, well, uh, some metadata things, and there is a backup with PG data that you have seen a moment before in the Postgres server. So uh, the ability to have uh, a backup somewhere uh, in outside location allows you to have access from a different location and set up uh, again a replication copy. So in my case, I have a different namespace. Mm -hmm. And in this different namespace, there is another, uh, yes. th there are another three servers, but those are completely different ones. So let's find uh, which one uh, living uh, the longest life. And again, let's use database. Yeah, it's also runs Postgres, but you can see that uh, the process names are slightly different. For example, here, uh, there is a wait for new wall file. So this should be uh, a replica. But at the same time, you can see wall sender. So this replica is also a primary, a leader for other servers. 
and again it's managed by Patroni and let's see what Patroni will report about this uh, group mm -hmm. okay we have a standby leader well if it's a leader this means that it sends uh, WAL files to other two servers. And if it's a standby, you cannot modify it. For example, if I run uh, create database zoo. Mm -hmm. Oh, OK. I can't run create database. But maybe this is a thing that already, yeah. Oh. Zoo database is already replicated. It means the database is in the other cluster, in the other namespace, but we have it also here in this namespace. Yeah, yeah. And those clusters are completely uh, invisible to each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, imagine the situation then uh, some hackers uh, made a total breakdown and your primary location is vanished. Someone consider it to remove everything, but there is no traces that are leading uh, to this uh, location except for the S3 uh, backup repository. And assuming that S3 backup repository is also managed by a different team, it's hard to believe that everything will be broken at the same time. So this will be uh, a safety thing uh, for your production setup. And of course, it could be in a different uh, geographic location. So hurricane in one location uh, will not uh, prevent you from making this server uh, primary and forget about your original cluster. But also we can actually get our lion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it means that the replicas also already have the database that the standby leader has. Well, originally uh, we started from a blank Mm -hmm. set up and uh, we have no uh, any databases uh, so and then I've created a zoo database and created a table mm -hmm. this could be uh, a useful setup mm -hmm. but again this is not the only option uh, because you can start from the existing backup from the existing cluster and then add as many clusters as you need. So let's try to do this because okay. uh, here I've used uh, a bit of automation to run commands to set up the cluster. Well, let's start and okay. while it's uh, starting, Uh, we will uh, draw things. Okay. So I want to have this standby cluster, but let's create it manually. Maybe yes. it will be better for understanding. Mm -hmm. So let's go to the uh, directory that contains GitHub repository for our operator. Okay. We actually don't need uh, the whole thing. Instead, uh, there is uh, a deploy directory, and it contains just a uh, well, few uh, YAML files. So uh, let's create a namespace. Oh, OK, create namespace. Uh, well, Let's use some imagination. So we have some zoo animals. Let's use, uh, I don't know, zoo as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then let's use kubectl and this zoo mm -hmm. and apply uh, bundle. This bundle contains all roles, all custom resource definitions, and deployment for the operator that require us to have an operator. 
Okay. Okay. There are many errors, but let's see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it should create the operator pod. Now it's running and we are ready to create Percona Postgres resource. Mm -hmm. And we can actually use the same one as I used for the Pigo uh, one. But before that, we should specify uh, how to access my S3 server. Okay, uh, there are some secrets. So what's inside the secrets? Uh, there is uh, a configuration file uh, encoded in base 64. Mm -hmm. So let's decode it. Okay, and we have a very sensitive stuff, but of course, because this is this installation is not connected to the internet, and I'm going to destroy it as soon as we finish, so no problem. So there, there is a key and a secret key, and for this particular setup, we don't have a proper SSL certificates, so we're not checking it. And this should be enough uh, to start cluster. But let's review what we have inside. Yes. Good some results, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, as you can see, there are many, many uh, commented lines. Let's try to see uh, without it. Will it work? Let's see. Okay. And the next thing, we also don't want to see empty lines. Yeah, nice. This is almost wonderful. The yeah. only thing that I miss is some color. It's better. better. <laughs> so uh, we are defining uh, several instances. We have three replicas, and this includes uh, the main server. So instead, let's make it a bit smaller. Let's use one replica. Okay. And also, uh, there are PG bouncers. But because we have just one replicas, let's set number of uh, proxies, number of connection pullers is zero. So we don't need connection pullers here. The next thing is backups, because you remember backups are important to set up our standby cluster. So we have a repository that pointing to the same Mineo server. Yeah, and there is a name for the secret that we have checked before. And one important thing that we don't want to modify this uh, bucket. Instead, we want to use it just a read only. So we have standby and we are defining that it will use REPL1. Okay. So this is a whole setup. Yeah, it was scary with many comments, but we are not using uh, many features uh, for this particular setup. So let's double check. Yeah, uh, the, we have used Zoom namespace. Uh, and now uh, let's try. Yeah. Before you continue, what we did until now was to use the Percon operator for PostgreSQL. You installed the operator, and now you customize the custom resource, adding some specific things to use a standby cluster, right? Is that correct? Yeah, we are going to start a completely new standby cluster with just one server inside a Zoom namespace. But of course, it could be not this uh, cluster. It could be a different cluster that will have access to this free storage. Okay, yes. It was created. Yeah, we still have PG bouncers, but we will fix it later. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So it's almost running. Yes. Yeah, one instance is already running. <laughs> so let's see, was I successful? Oops, not this one. Okay, and as you can see here, it's still waiting for the wolf house. So let's see patronic status. Yeah, we have this standby cluster. So let's double check our uh, YAML to see that, yeah, I. Uh, modified, but I've modified a wrong file. So I've modified a file with stripped comments, but it wasn't saved in the So let's change it uh, to demonstrate that we can shrink the server. Okay. We can shrink this cluster just to have oh. one node okay. and zero uh, PG bouncers. Oh, no, go, but do. Yeah, now we have pretty simple setup. So yeah, let's see what's inside. Yeah, and we have the same database and this database receiving changes in real time. So you can have a really powerful main cluster and then you can create as many clusters uh, as you want that will have actual data. And this data uh, is updated uh, almost at the same time as your primary cluster. Yeah, nice, we did it. <laughs> Nicolai, one question here. Uh, you work with, with several customers also. What is the most question, the question that most of them ask you about this standby? Because um, some of them I can imagine they are using already, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the thing is, uh, the default usage like we have used here is so easy that there is no problems here. But uh, there are interesting effects that if you have a, a transaction started uh, on the primary cluster, and this transaction uh, was started before uh, your most recent backup, the standby cluster will never allow to connect uh, until you will kill this uh, original idle transaction. Mm -hmm. So this looks confusing, but this is how Postgres replication works. Postgres mm -hmm. replication requires that at the moment of the standby startup, you should have no active transactions. So if you are using just short life transaction, this is totally okay. But if you have uh, some really long running transactions, like someone executed begin uh, and then the same select and then well, he completely forgot that uh, he has this terminal and uh, well, consider it to have a vacation. So in this case, uh, the rest of DBA team could spend hours uh, trying to understand why they are creating standby clusters or creating new replicas, and those replicas are not coming up. Postgres is a really nice database but it has own implementation details and you cannot totally ignore implementation details. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this is not the thing that you're just connecting to the database and running some queries. Mm -hmm. uh, even if you're using operators, you should have some understanding of Postgres replication 
well, even if you can create as many replicas as you want with just a few comments or one click. Mm -hmm. Okay, understood. And uh, um, we saw that the, also we use QR separators for this installation. And summarizing how QR separators could be used to follow what is the advantage to use it, for example, in this in this installation that we did installing standby cluster and also replicating in another namespace. So uh, normally uh, people using just well, one database, but as big a company uh, grows, uh, many additional uh, teams starting to use more databases and at some point uh, as a dba you can uh, find a situation that you don't have enough time to do a uh, good job you don't have all backups you don't have monitoring for everything and it's even not possible to check what uh, went wrong with application two days ago because you don't have for this specific database you don't have performance graphs all this automation uh, easier with kubernetes because with kubernetes you can have as many servers as you want of course from the pool that uh, other administrators provided for you and you can have dedicated servers for your databases that not uh, buffered by application team for example and at the same time, it's easier to balance between uh, completely idle hardware and uh, the problem that we have so many databases running on one host. So Kubernetes makes uh, a real load balancing easier for multiple projects. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, it's not only about performance, it's also about security because database installation tending to use some really old operating system version old libraries and even old version of the database but here if we check our configuration so let's use this stripped version as i had before so you see that uh, i'm saying that i want postgres 16 here but it could be 14 or 15. And the ability to set the database version just with changing a single parameter, this is a great thing. Mm -hmm. Then I will need an upgrade. I will change numbers mm -hmm. and uh, the upgrade uh, will happen. Uh, and if I need an old version of the database, uh, system administrators linux administrators still will be able to upgrade linux kernel in this machine to avoid security breaches for us. okay that's nice <laughs> thanks thank you for the explanation uh, um to conclude uh, would you like to drop um what we did to summarize so the audience can see without... yeah let's do this because actually uh not everyone uh has ability to understand text information and instead we need some visuals to uh, understand things better could you just oh. now i have yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay so let me check oh okay i am selecting so let's draw things so we started from a single uh, database server okay. but this was a really small moment and right after that we got uh, two replicas. So yeah, that was standby, uh, replicated to other two servers. Yes. So this is a standby and both are in the same location. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, physically it could be multiple locations because you can have Kubernetes cluster that's spread across multiple uh, availability zones. Yeah, this is also possible. Uh, but let's assume that 
this at least some close location like 200 kilometers or so so uh in addition we have a backup so because backups are really scary and important let's throw it in red <laughs> so we have s3 okay mm -hmm. so and uh, our primary writing uh write ahead logs directly to the s3 server as soon as you write ahead log already so uh and uh, right after this we are starting another cluster another cluster is configured from the s3 so it's not a primary but it's a standby leader okay so this standby leader getting data from the s3 only we can configure it to have uh, a real-time data updates we can configure it also to have a second channel of replication, same as this. So yeah, but in our setup, it wasn't configured. So, but this is possible. Okay. So, and this standby uh, cluster, it was pgo one space. So it, uh, uh, we has also three nodes. So this is standby, but those standbys related directly to this one. And they are not receiving data from S3. Instead, they are receiving data directly from standby. Yeah. Yeah, and we have another one as well. So just standby. So this was go one PG operator one. And this was uh, Pigo. Oops. Pigo. Okay. And then we consider it that we need a database that created while we already have some data set. And even if we have a data set, it's not a problem to create another data standby cluster. Originally, it was created with three nodes, but then we shrinked it to have just a single one. Mm -hmm. So it also created from just S3. Yeah. And we can destroy it uh, as soon as this cluster is not needed. So it could be some one-time activity like do tests, and then destroy everything because well for testing uh, purposes yeah mocking is very important mm -hmm. you should not use some production ready data uh, to test but this not allows to do some scale testing then you should understand is this new feature uh, works fine if number of users is not 100 but well, two billions <laughs> Yeah, and you need a production database, but you worry that new code will corrupt this uh, data if we provide uh, access. Yes. And if the data is not broken, we can provide access to the standby. Even if the application is not able to break this database, it mm -hmm. still can create a necessary load that can kill the server. So we don't want this situation. Mm -hmm. uh, instead, it's better to create a completely separate one and it will not consume uh, resources from the original cluster. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, that was really nice. Something more that would, would you like to add it? <laughs> well, I would like uh, to see more users for this technology because uh, even in our small case today, we shown that well, if you need the standby, it's you should not read the whole Postgres documentation from the beginning till very end, and you should not repeat it every two months. So instead, it's enough to create corresponding uh, custom resource file or 
even apply uh, the YAML in runtime. So, oh, you can push your uh, YAML to your favorite uh, repository and use GitOps to create a cluster for you. Okay. <laughs> if you have more questions, you if you are watching this video and you have more questions, please let us ask in the comments below. And thank you so much, Nicola. I hope we can have more videos like this. This was really, really interesting, hands-on, and also drawing and a lot of concepts to understand. That's, we appreciate it, your time. So we hope to see you in a second video. <laughs> yes, see you and we'll be happy to work with your questions as well. We can uh, dedicate a whole video if you would provide many, many questions. Or we can reply in a blog post if uh, it will be enough to have just text replies. Yes, thank you so much, Nicola. <laughs> and see you in the next video. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. you. Bye. -bye. <laughs>